Gracias por acompañarnos. Hoy tenemos un panel y una conversación muy interesante sobre una condición muy rara eh, que en Puerto Rico está eh, se manifiesta con eh, mayor número. Según vamos a poner muy pronto, me acompaña el doctor Alberto Santiago Cormier, quien es el secretario de la Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, encantado de estar aquí con ustedes. Vamos a estar hablando sobre el síndrome Alzheimer, que pues ese es el nombre de los científicos ¿no? que pidieron ¿no? identificar la condición. También vamos a estar hablando con una artista y bailarina, artista y Hayley, que de su mente es pequeña, la tenemos allá desde Nueva York, ¿cómo se encuentra artista? Hoy? I'm good, estoy muy bien, ¿cómo es usted? Ay, me encantaba de que puedas participar en esta conversación. Tu historia es una historia que merece que el mundo entero la conozca. Y gracias al doctor Cornel por este punto, a nuestra producción de la revista de la Salud Pública. Y también tenemos al fotógrafo, que es una persona que ha retratado la esencia de lo que es Tiffany, que es un libro, es un artista, a Sael Gore, lo que es un artista, y está Happy to join you. Thank you. For how long have you been uh, an artist? How long have you been an artist? I've been an artist for many years, but I also used to have a day job. I'm a software architect by day job. But a few years back, uh, one of the companies that I co-founded was purchased by Microsoft, and that gave me the opportunity to decide to dedicate my entire time and my entire energy to my art. And the project that I did with Tiffany and the book that we did together is really my big first project as a full-time artist. Well, and I can see there's a link with uh, probably your appreciation for structure that probably, right, that helps you capture the beauty of Tiffany. And we'll be talking about the book too, we would like to talk about the singing folks and have our public know what we're talking about. Así que me gustaría pasar con el doctor Santiago Corniel sobre esta condición ¿no? y también bueno, vamos a hablar un poquito de Jarko Levin Syndrome o síndrome de Jarko Levin. Como bien dice la palabra, realmente eso es el nombre de las personas que inicialmente eh, describieron el, el síndrome en 1937. Eh, fue la primera vez que se describe y de hecho se describe en dos pacientes de herencia puertorriqueña porque eh, Jarko estudió un año en la Escuela de Medicina Tropical de la, de, la, de la Escuela de Medicina de la Universidad de Puerto Rico. Así que yo estoy seguro que él probablemente estuvo en contacto con esos pacientes durante el año que estuvo en Puerto Rico, eh, en, lo, en los años 30. Eh, Jarko le dijo una condición genética eh, autosómica recesiva. Eso significa que ambos papás portan eh, un gen que está mutado, en este caso tienen variantes genéticas que se llama el MES2 o Posterior Mesoderm 2. Es un gen que es parte de un grupo de genes que son los responsables de formar la vértebra y en este caso MES2 da las instrucciones para que las costillas se puedan pegar apropiadamente a las eh, vértebras que les toca. Cuando esa información no sucede, pues las costillas no saben qué hacer literalmente. Imagínate una carretera donde se dañan todas las luces de tráfico, pues obviamente hay un caos. Pues eso es lo que pasa en esta espina dorsal de pacientes con Jaco Levin, que hay un caos eh, de, de defectos de segmentación y los pacientes tienen números, numerosas anomalías en sus vértebras y sus costillas como una forma de proteger esos pulmones, se fusionan, se pegan unas a otras eh, y da ese pecho, que es lo que llamamos, eh, eh, realmente el nombre médico es displasia espondilotorácica, que dice que es un pecho corto y agrandado hacia el frente. <coughs> eh, y claro, el problema de estos pacientes es que al tener una espina acortada y un tórax tan pequeño, los pulmones no pueden respirar apropiadamente y un número eh, significativamente alto de ellos pues puede tener serias complicaciones respiratorias y también la mortalidad de estos pacientes puede ser 
eh, mucho más alta que de una persona que obviamente no tiene anomalía. Claro, no es que Exacto. Eh, en el 2003 eh, identificamos el gen responsable de la condición, que es el MES-2, y se hizo con eh, la información de ADN de pacientes puertorriqueños y estaba publicado en el, en el American Journal of Human Genetics, el paper, y hemos publicado muchas, eh, varias publicaciones, ¿verdad? Tanto de los aspectos genéticos como de los aspectos clínicos de los pacientes con Jarcolevin, porque básicamente yo he dedicado mi carrera científica eh, a... a Estudiar la condición, estudiar la historia natural de la condición y obviamente a seguir eh, acumulando eh, conocimiento en cuanto a la mutación genética y cómo eso se manifiesta en, manifesta en, en síntomas o en un fenotipo que es como los geneticistas le llamamos a eso. Como claro, tú dijiste. Sí, hay, hay que señalar también, doctor, que también en Puerto Rico, en la concentración de la gente. Sí, Puerto Rico Entonces, tiene el Sí, tiene la, la prevalencia más alta en el mundo reportada. De hecho, eh, la última vez que yo eh, protegí la literatura médica, de todos los casos reportados en la historia, más del 60% son puertorriqueños. Y, y hemos reportado grupos de más de 25 de, 25 de casos. Eh, obviamente, a través de la, de la historia de los años, pues hemos tenido contacto con muchos pacientes. Como dije, Puerto Rico tiene una incidencia bien alta, la más reportada en el mundo. Y por lo tanto, todos los años nacen de uno a tres niños con esa condición en nuestra población, por lo menos los puertorriqueños en Puerto Rico. Probablemente okay. las poblaciones puertorriqueñas en otro lado, como en Nueva York, que tenemos una población puertorriqueña alta, pues no, no tenemos conocimiento de, de la data de allá, ¿verdad? Sin embargo, donde quiera que haya mucho puertorriqueño, va a haber una incidencia más alta de esta condición porque nosotros tenemos un, somos portadores en una, en una frecuencia mucho más alta que el resto de las etnias. ¿Y esto realmente no sabemos a qué se debe? Sí, sabemos a qué se debe. Viene, viene de los españoles, el aplotipo, cuando estábamos hace muchos años estudiando esto, eh, el aplotipo del, de las mutaciones del gen MES2 son idénticas a las de los pacientes de Islas Canarias. De hecho, tenemos un paciente que su mamá es puertorriqueña y su papá es de Islas Canarias y tienen exactamente la misma secuencia en el gen de MES2 con las mismas mutaciones. Así es que eso se debe a que nos viene vía eh, Islas Canarias a Puerto Rico y sucede por eh, aislamiento geográfico o lo que se conoce como founder effect, un efecto fundador. Son genes que caen en una región donde es pequeña, poca población, empiezan a casarse dentro de esa misma población y obviamente aumenta las frecuencias de esa mutación. Yo, pues, como yo le digo a la gente, imagínate tú vivir en la montaña en Puerto Rico en 1700 o en 1800. ¿Con quién tú te casabas? Pues con tus vecinos, con la gente del barrio, porque no había carretera, no había carros. Eh, apenas, probablemente el caballo era también de, de mucho poder adquisitivo, así que el que era pobre no tenía acceso ni tan siquiera un caballo. Así que usted, esa, ese aislamiento geográfico, produce un efecto de aumento de mutaciones eh, por consanguinidad y aunque no se reconozcan como primos o primos lejanos, sino sencillamente por comunidades pequeñas que empiezan a casarse unos entre otros. Y eso lo vemos no solamente con Jarko Levin, sino con varias enfermedades. Puerto Rico es famoso en el mundo porque tenemos la incidencia más alta de varias enfermedades genéticas. Jarko Levin o, o spondylotoracic dysplasia eh, o displasia espondilotorácica en español eh, es solo una de ellas. Pues como usted mencionó, donde quiera que hay población puertorriqueña, que tiene que ser más alta. Por eso estamos en conversación con los ciudadanos que hoy mencionan, que es el estudio de los puertorriqueños en la ciudad de Nueva York, que es la razón de la vez de la nación. Ahora, ¿y cómo se puede entrar? Antes de la razón, sí, mami, I'm sorry, it's really hard to hear you. Okay, I'm going to try to ask you an English show, which would probably be easier. Um, we know you're a ballerina and an actress, but tell us what's going on as a kid. Um, did you have respiratory problems? Can you tell the public what it's like to live with the uh, Dorothy Logan? Well, 
I know. Well, I was born in the mid '80s, and I know at the time, you know, there wasn't any. My parents had no idea I was going to come out with Jago Levin syndrome or spondylothoracic dysplasia. They had no idea, and the day I was born was a surprise. Mm-hmm. Eso presa, no? And they didn't know. Nobody knew anything. The doctors couldn't really give them a good, you know, like, what's going to happen to your child. All they told my parents was they really didn't know what it was, what it was going to happen, but it was very scary. They said I was not going to make it. I was going to die the first night. I was going to grow backwards into a ball. Mm -hmm. I was going to not be able to do anything. I was going to be completely a vegetable, like, and, so and, parents, that, I'm sorry, and unfortunately, Tiffany, that is still 20 years later the case. We still have most of these pa- uh, patients are born without being di- prenatally diagnosed, which is unacceptable because most uh, pregnant women have two or three old prenatal ultrasounds during the, their pregnancy. And why yeah. this is not being diagnosed, I, I really don't want to say the word, <laughs> the word, but it's tro- totally not accepted. Not only that, I'm sure that the physicians, when you were born, told your parents that you were going to die next day, and then when next month, she's not going to live six months, maybe not a exactly. year, and, then when, yep. and that when, when you get to a year, she's not going to make it through the year five, etc., etc., etc. And it's very, very shameful that 20-something years later, with all the, the medical literature that is available, it's yes, still okay. the same. It's the same. You- it's the same that physicians... Not only in Puerto Rico, in, in anywhere in the world, but even in the United States, that is supposed to have a, such a sophisticated uh, medicine in some areas, you know, they still don't know what this is. They still don't know how to manage it, and and unfortunately, that will add up to the morbidity and mortality of these patients. Right, and, and I realize that, that um, there's multiple different. Uh, Jarko-Levin. Not everybody has the same. Well, well, because there are two subtypes within the Jarko-Levin conundrum. You know, Jarko-Levin could be a spondylothoracic dysostosis, which is what you have, and what ninety percent of Puerto Ricans have. We all, and there is also spondylocostal dysostosis, which is a milder version of the disease, which can also happen in Puerto Ricans, but it's much more frequent in other ethnic backgrounds than in Puerto oh. Rico. So those yeah. are the two subtypes. And the spondylothoracic are the ones who are have the most severe thoracic restriction. So for many more respiratory complications versus the spondylocostal, who tends to have no such a significant respiratory complications in early in their life, but later they will develop some other skeletal abnormalities such as severe scoliosis, which is the spine will curve. Uh, severely, and they will require uh, surgical interventions, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So it's very important to know what this is, because after all, this is a pan-ethnic disease. This could happen; it's been described anywhere in the world. And 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 I got emails, you know, from everywhere in the world every time one of these children uh, are born, because no one knows what to do except they Google something, and someone with last name Cornier or Santiago Cornier happens to to. to I've written a couple of papers about this. Um, I, I think it's unacceptable. Why don't yeah. we do genetic testing for it? I mean, it's a double recessive gene, I understand. So in families that have a history, you can check for that genetically, even before pregnancy. And sure. The problem is, like most autosomal recessive disorders, you don't know that you carry those genes until you have a child with a disease. Because most uh, autosomal recessive uh, carriers are silent carriers. You know what I mean? Remember yeah, that yeah. this could happen. It's a one in twenty-five. It's a twenty-five percent chance on each pregnancy. So they could have had three children, and none of them have the, the disease, and still be carriers. You know what I mean? And, and as a matter of fact, if you have uh, brothers and sisters, Tiffany, they may have a fifty-first percent chance of being carriers of the MES2 mutation. Um, yes, yeah, so so, I have siblings. So uh, it's that's the problem that most autosomal recessive disease, diseases or disorder. People don't know that they're carried unless there is family history or family background of all their uh, affected members with the with the disease, and that's what happened. But once you, uh, why this is not identified in triuterine, I have no idea. I truly, that that really blows my mind because 
it's like I don't know why you pointed that probe, but said, <laughs> uh, certainly uh, you did not took a look at the spine because even if you don't know what it is, you know that something really abnormal is going on. Right, I don't understand that. It's just, I mean, it's a curve. You know, like I, I've been blessed. My mom and my parents did a lot of work to make sure that they raised me como si fuera normal. And I don't even like to use that word. Porque tú eres normal. Because you yeah, are normal. But, right. So I got to do everything that otherwise, you know, I probably shouldn't have. I was in the, I, sure. I, 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 I play an instrument. You know, my mother put me in after school dance. That's why I became a dancer because it was something. My mom put me in it for after school so that I could mm -hmm. make friends and be, you know, moving around and not get so stiff. And I really think that has helped me in my life. I don't have respiratory issues at this moment. I have mm -hmm. not had any, you know, yes, mm -hmm. walking upstairs, walking flights, walking. Yes, my lungs are a bit more restricted and they get tired faster, but mm -hmm. I'm still capable to, you know, do everything like everybody else does. And so the whole dancing was just an after school thing for me. And then it mm -hmm. became what it is now. And then with that, I was able to meet Asael and work on this project with him. And it's just opened up so many doors. Uh, granted, growing up wasn't easy either, you know, and even as an adult, it's still not easy. And we can get into that in a few, but it, you know, life is not easy, but no, no, no. it's possible. Well, I think that, you know, I, I, I didn't meet you before today. So uh, first of all, I'm really honored to, to get to know you because you dare to be yourself. And I think that's the most important uh, thing in life. Uh, be who you are and be proud of who you are. It doesn't matter what. Second of all, you are giving a voice to a lot of people who doesn't have a voice and they need to have that. And to Mr. or the artist Asai Dror, when I first saw your pictures, my eyes were full of tears. They're that beautiful. Thank you. The idea was basically, and, and the idea of the book, and we came out with a book, and, and it's called The Beauty of Tiffany, and the idea was to show that somebody who's very different can also be very, very beautiful. There is no contradiction. Exactly. And exactly. Tiffany... It's, it's finding and, beauty in... Beauty is not a stereotype. Unfortunately, we live in a society that beauty is very stereotyped. And uh, beauty is can, can be in anything, in the most simple things. And she's a very beautiful uh, young lady, but also she dares to be who you are, who she is. And, yes, and I she's think out it, of that, and that is shown through your artistic work, and it's beautiful, simply beautiful. Thank you, thank you. So that, Master, that, that, masterful. It, it was really masterful. Thank you. So the idea of the project was basically again that to show beyond even this specific disease and beyond even disability you show that somebody can be very different and still very very good and mm -hmm. tiffany was in one respect great for that because she's unique she's beautiful and she's comfortable with who she is because mm -hmm. you know when i shoot the book the book has does not have any doesn't cover anything i've done no post processing i don't erase anything you know i don't try to make her perfect this is who she is and that's what the book is about. The book is called The Beauty of Tiffany. And Tiffany, how, uh, how did you, when you got the proposal, how did you feel about it? And then what happened during the photo session? And obviously, what's happening in your life after that? The first time that Asael came and asked me to ask you about the project, right? La primera vez, I was like, no. Yo no sé, yo, sin ropa, ahí, like, just letting myself out there so everybody can see. Like, I'm not even comfortable with my body, and yet you want me to show everyone else? And I, I at first I was like, no, I don't think so. But then I said, you know what? Vamos, jodete, let's do it. <laughs> and we did some photos, and I fell in love with them. He did say if I did not like them, we would not, we would not continue. 
And I looked, we did a shoot, and I fell in love with all the images he took. And I said, let's, let's, let, let's keep going. And, and I was nervous. I was so nervous, but I was very excited at the same time. I'm still nervous about it. I think it was an interesting process because for Tiffany, it's about her. For me, she is the art project. So I don't have the emotion, some of the emotional attachment that she does. So, you know, and we often had an image that was just gorgeous artistically. And Tiffany would look at it and say, no. And I told her, you know what? You have veto power. Why don't you think about it? And, and let's talk about it in a week or two. And after a week or two, she, she said, oh, I love it. And I would say, mm, great. And that happened again and again and again, you know. But I would just look at the image and I think it's gorgeous. And she looks at it and says, oh my God, you know, I'm not symmetrical or something like that. Well, and Because she's confronting so, her, her own demons and what society have tell her for so many, many years, you know, and that's the, I'm a geneticist, so I'm used to this, not only for jarko syndrome, but I have many, many children with different types of syndromes that I, I find them beautiful in their own, as human beings and as, and as a person, you know, and they all have different uh, uh, clinical manifestations or, or they are labeled as different. Um, I think that in my world, they are my normal, you know, because that's what I've dedicated my life to. So for me, all my patients are normal. The abnormal ones are the one outside making a judgment. Yeah, and I say that I think there's a terrible world also. I think that one of the things that happened, especially, you know, in, in the last decade and more so with social media, is the standardization. This is beauty. That's the definition of beauty. You know, you have to have blonde hair, blue eyes, be this tall, and it's too bad because we're losing a lot of beauty that has been beauty for all of humanity. And sure. this is one of those things that I'm trying to change, or at least make a dent in that. Mm -hmm. How to, I mean, what was your, what was growing up like? Were you, did you have other, uh, were you sick a lot of times? Did you just, you know, what, what was your relationship with your, with your siblings, with your brothers? I, I was not sick a lot. I think I got sick once when I was a child. I was maybe two years old, and I was in the hospital, but that was for pneumonia. I never had any surgery. My mother did not want to do any of that because the doctor said it was a 50-50, a 50 of life and 50 of death. And then they told her that they could straighten my back, but I might they can't do my neck, so I'll be looking up in the sky the whole time. It's very, very scary, and my parents were like, no, 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 no. They had asked me. We're going to just raise her regular, and that's it. Um, I didn't notice anything was different until I was maybe a teenager. When, you know, you're in junior high and you start to have little crushes or you want to be a little girly with your nail polish and you want to look cute. And I didn't look like none of that. I wasn't the, I wasn't a popular girl. I, 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 that's when I knew I was different. I didn't notice as a child that much. I didn't pay attention to it. But as a teenager, it definitely opened my eyes. And it wasn't easy and still not easy. But but at the end of the day, it's my life and it's the cards I've been dealt. And I have to live it the best that I can. I mean, I love my siblings. I have four brothers and one sister. And I'm the only one in the family that has JLS. But we're all very close. And they, I adore every one of them. I am the oldest. Um, you know, and I'm the only one that lives in New York City. All my siblings either live in Puerto Rico or Florida. Um, so I'm the only one that's in the big city, which is exciting for them. Um, and you know, to do things that I didn't know I could do. I'm driving a car. I own a vehicle. I drive. I never thought I could do that ever. You know, I'm not tall enough. I'm not even four feet tall. I, I can't do anything. I can't turn my neck. I can't, you know, so there's a lot of things I didn't think that I could do when I got older, and I'm able to do them. I have a license. I, I drive to Florida, Sola. I do everything I can by myself, the best that I can. And, and um, you know, I had a good childhood. I had a good childhood. I have great parents, and I have great siblings, 
and they never treated me any different or anything. If anything, they were always like, let's go climb a tree or let's go do this or let's go do that. Pero mi papá, mi papá, huh? If he could, he would have me in a little bubble in his pocket because he doesn't want me to get hurt. Even still, as an adult, when I go visit him, I'm 35. And he goes, you can't do that. Tú no puedes hacer eso, Tiffany. I'm like, oh, sí. Oh, sí. And I'm all the time, still. But it is what it is. Like, you know, my parents are great. My siblings are great. You know, growing up in school, it was it was hard. They didn't want me. They didn't allow me to do things. I couldn't go on a trip. I couldn't join this, the, the school band. I couldn't play gym. I couldn't do a lot of things because they were scared that I was going to get hurt or break. And my mother fought and fought and fought to allow them, to allow me to, part, to, to partake and participate in those things as a child should in school. Um, so there was a lot of fighting from my mom, you know, to allow me to have my rights and experience things that a normal child should. Um, so I'm forever grateful for that because if not, I wouldn't be able to do, I would not have done half the things I, I've done in my life. You know, and as an adult, it's still not easy as an adult. You know, I, you know why I got a car? I got a car because I got tired of taking the train on the bus or walking the streets of New York City and people videotaping me just because or taking my picture on the train or the bus or walking by just because so they could send it to their friends and make fun. I have memes. There's memes of me online that, that make fun of me. You know? That's what I have to deal with. In 2020, at 35, and probably to the day I die, I'm still going to have to deal with that because that's just the way people are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it, and it's not easy. Don't get me wrong. People think I'm like, whatever about it, it's okay. Oh no. I fight my own battles internally. I keep quiet myself. Mm -hmm. Because I have, what am I supposed to do? What, like stay in a corner and stay in my house and never go out because of school, school people. Mm -hmm. I have to say that adding to what Tiffany just said, I'm going to say in English and Spanish for the benefit hey. of Latin American uh, 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 audience, uh, that Jack Levin syndrome, regardless if it's uh, spondylothoracic or spondylocostal, they have no, zero, non-intellectual abnormalities. These are very intelligent people, very capable people. We have physicians with that disease in Puerto Rico. We have engineers. We have accountants. We have sportsmen. So it's, 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 you only have the uh, congenital vertebral abnormalities and the rib fusion, period. And the complication just comes from that um, uh, pulmonary abnormalities. And in some patients like you are very lucky because they have... A, a, a very large thorax and so forth, they have less uh, respiratory complications. Mm -hmm. Most patients with spondylothoracic dysostosis will not need any surgery, particularly mm -hmm. if they have survived the first four or five years of life, they will not need any surgery. It's not only, it's not indicated, it's probably experimental. On the contrary, if you have spondylocostal dysostosis, you will develop uh, scoliosis later in life, and then you will need probably surgery to correct that uh, sur so that's the uh, spine curvature. Um, so, in español, la paciente con Jacob-Levin syndrome no tienen una inteligencia normal. Son personas capaces como cualquiera de nosotros. Son médicos, son ingenieros, son contables, son artistas y bailarinas como es Stephanie eh, y tienen una vida tan normal como ellos quieren y la, la sociedad les da la oportunidad de que tengan eh, y es importante que sepan que la mayoría de los pacientes con spondylothoracic disostosis o ya Levin que es el que es más típico en Puerto Rico si no tienen problemas respiratorios no hay necesidad de ninguna operación y los problemas respiratorios van a venir en el periodo neonatal en, cuando nacen, en esas primeras semanas, meses de vida, en esos primeros años. Si ahí no los hay, no los va a haber o no los va a haber en, eh, de, para necesidad de cirugía. Sin embargo, muchos niños de, con Jaco Levin pueden tener serios problemas respiratorios al nacer y eso puede ser que requieran intubación o que requieran traqueostomía. Quiero decir que en Puerto Rico 
este lunes 24 de agosto se hizo por primera vez la primera eh, esternotomía para poner una traqueotomía a un paciente con riesgo de vida. Eso sí es historia. Porque es una oportunidad de vida para ese paciente que antes no tenía. Eso pasó y se va a hacer una conferencia de prensa que no quiero dar muchos detalles porque inclusive, aunque yo soy parte de eso, eh, no me pertenece a mí, ¿verdad? Ni soy el cirujano, pero se hizo en el Bayamón Children's Hospital y pronto va a salir a la, a la pública. Y el niño está estable. Sí, sí, uh, me gustaría escucharle a Sael. Eh, a Sael, ¿qué es el post de la publicación? La publicación del libro, y eso es, por supuesto, el libro. And it is on Amazon, and you can also find it through the website, thebeautyoftiffany.com. And the idea, again, is basically to, it, when I say change, it may be too ambitious, to put a dent in people's perception about beauty. To what we talked about before, the, what I call the brainwashing of society, of what beauty needs to be, to try to change that a little bit. That's the main thing. The other issue is, if you look from an artistic point of view, from a photographic point of view, that books that have been done about people with disability and somebody like Diane Arbash comes to mind, they you always tend to either show pity to the people who are different or to show them as freaks. And the whole idea of the book is basically to show, no, she is not that different, she is certainly not a freak, she's just a beautiful woman, but different. And that's what the book is trying to achieve. But I don't know if we can get back to Tiffany. She's probably home by now. Are you home by now? You you have your mute on. No, I'm home. I just don't want to go in the elevator and lose you guys. Oh, okay. Um, so what do you expect from the book? Hope that it does help and make that dent and change in society, in people's perception and view of of uh, different uh, and not be so afraid, stop being so afraid and uncomfortable around mm -hmm. something that looks so different. There's no need to be so uncomfortable and so scared. And and a lot of times, you know, when you walk around and pe people jump or they get scared because you just walk by them and startle them, that doesn't feel good. You know, like none of none of that feels good. But I hope that it does exactly that and it opens up people's minds so we can have a conversation. You know, the point is to have the conversation and educate mm -hmm. so that people are aware and they can know more about it because that's also the issue. Not being educated about it and not discussing it is why we, we live the way we live and also keeping us so closed in. If people open their minds to see that we're just like everyone else, especially mentally, then there's no reason just to, you know, treat us different. Just because I look different doesn't mean anything. You look different than, than, you know, Pedro and Maria. Everybody looks different. Nobody looks the same. And people forget that. And, and even in the body, everything is different in the body, even our own body. You know, one side is longer than the other. And that's just the way it is for life. So I'm hoping that people could see that, oh, it doesn't look how I'm, how I'm used to seeing it, but it's actually really pretty, or it's actually not bad, but just to start to get them to think. Um, your story is very inspiring, and I'm sure, I don't know if you've already been on, on national television or, or massive media, you have? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I did a documentary. I have a documentary on TLC called Two in a Million, where I meet another another woman who has Jekyll Levens as well, and she has a son, and we get I to meet. Correct that the title is incorrect. The frequency of Jekyll Levin in Puerto Rico is not two in a million. So, I agree with you. It's a, I didn't it's want that title. It's approximately one in fifteen thousand, twelve thousand to fifteen thousand. <laughs> No, trust me. I was like, I don't like that title, but the titles they came up with were worse. I know. I know. So that's the one I did. But, you know, yeah, I've, I've done a couple of TV things and, 
you know, things like that, just discussing what we are discussing right now. But I really want to keep making a change. I really want to, you know, push forward and advocate for that change and that vision difference. I like and you just so say something that re it's really important. The picture, besides being a beautiful, beautiful art work of art, um, and I'm an art lover, particularly. You can see behind me, I have, those are the, uh, 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 paintings from the 50s of Puerto Rican artists. So I've been collecting Latin American art for over 30 or 40 years. Um, and the, that should be a textbook in, in any art school, in any photography <laughs> school, because it's, it's exquisitely done. But also, like you just brilliantly say, it start a conversation. And that's the purpose. The purpose is not to be afraid, but to talk about it and talk of what our differences. Because after all, like you say, inside we're all the same. And, and, and particularly we're living in a society that it, our differences are unfortunately just too over um, emphasized. You know, we're not only because of uh, congenital malformation, but because of skin color, because of uh, whatever. So it is very important to understand that we all human beings, we are 99.9 .9 identical in our genome. So our genetic information is 99.9 .9 identical. It's only 0.1 to differentiate the rest of us. So we should focus on that 99.9 .9 and not in that point, which is what we're doing as a society. And that's extremely wrong. I'm hoping with the book, I'll be able to, I'm hoping with the book, me and Asael could be out there more like we're doing today and, and talking about it. Go ahead, Asael, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Now, I was going to say that it, specifically about Tiffany, to what we were talking before, a lot of her problems are not because of the disease, but because of society's reaction to the disease. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I don't know what percent, but certainly a major part is, you know, the fact that she walks down the street and people go, oh, right? And the fact that she goes to inter a job interview and people go like that. And that's really what's limiting her a lot more than anything that has to do with the disease, at least in Tiffany's case. He, he's, he made such a good point about y yeah, your life and the way your parents helped you psychologically, physically, the way you, within your condition, uh, lived a fairly um, stick-free life in the beginning, but then it's the social uh, part, uh, discrimination, the bias, um, the society has that's the worst of, of all sickness. Yeah, I mean, nobody likes, you know, you don't like when people are laughing at you, like, you know, you your hair is funny, and they're just laughing at you and pointing at you. Nobody likes that, you know, and so that means I don't like it either. You know, that's the thing people forget, and it, it's not, it being this easy, it's being this easy to get up mm -hmm. every day, especially in New York City, where it's very diverse over here, but people act like, I don't know, I don't know. You know, and then, you know, I'm on social media. I've been told to kill myself. I've been told mm -hmm. I'm an alien. I've been told, what the hell is that? I've been told, that's why natural selection ex exists. I've been told, your parents should have aborted you. I, so many things. So many, and, and then it gets to a really perverted sexual thing too. And, you know, and I have to go deal with that every day. But I have family. I have a great boyfriend that, you know, I mean, I'm so secure with him and my family and my friends. But it does affect. It does. It's not easy. So mm -hmm. yeah, as I was saying, I don't have issues health wise, but my disability affects my daily life because people judge me on, on the fact of my body and I can't change that and it doesn't feel good, but it is what it is. And I, you know, it, dancing has helped. I think if I didn't dance, I probably wouldn't be who I am today. I would not have my assay out to do the book. You know, I wouldn't have probably drove a car and got my license. Uh, I would have not done a lot of things. Like, I definitely would have been home alone and in, in, in a corner. But it allowed me, and I think it helped my health. I think 
dancing, you know, it's very active. It's like going to the gym, you know. So I'm working out. I'm I'm working on my heart and my lungs and all of that. And that's I think it really really helped me as an adult grow up to be so healthy. You know, I had COVID, but I didn't know I had it. I had two symptoms that I lost my taste of I lost my sense of taste and smell for 20 days, but that was it. That was it. And and my parents were so afraid that I was going to get sick really bad, you know, because of my, this is my, I don't even like to call it a disease, because of my, my disability. But I'm very healthy. Gracias a Dios that I'm very healthy. And, and I thank my parents for that because I think that helps. Being physically active definitely makes a difference. I'm so limber. Not only that, but by being physically active, you are forcing your lung to expand. And one of the recent, one of the compensatory uh, mechanisms for patient, for adult patients with this disease uh, is that their lung almost become a uh, go down all the way down to the abdomen. It's called abdominal lungs. And that's the frontal part of it. And then they develop an extension of the lung bases. And that's where the most of the oxygen exchange happens anyway at the lung base. And that's a compensatory movement. And the more you exercise, the, lo- the 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 stronger that compensatory mechanism will be. So, and that's because you're a dancer and you're doing this, you do that. That will truly help you on the long run because you have a more long capacity than a person that will have just a very sedentary life. I feel so like I'm going to talk about it. I love this. I love learning more about it. I know a little bit. Like I know about the the um, chromosome and how it, you know it's it's not it's not it's not um active and then it gets active like I learned the the, the basics but to hear you like talk more about it I'm like oh wow that's so cool to learn. It, it's very interesting. Los pacientes con Jack Collins pueden vivir una vida activa. La mayoría de ellos, obviamente, no no todos van a comenzar en el periodo neonatal, pero sí. eventualmente mientras más activos estén mejor va a ser el mecanismo de desarrollo de las bases pulmonares, que como dije en inglés, casi se prolongan dentro del abdomen. Y cuando tú ves un CT scan o una placa de ellos, los abdomen se ven, los pulmones se ven casi que llegan, no, casi no llegan al abdomen. Y es un mecanismo de defensa para compensar el intercambio de oxígeno en las bases pulmonares. Aprovecho eso, para decir, porque usted no conocía a Tiffany, Tiffany no, no. sabía ese dato, eh, as I no sé cómo, how you met Tiffany, but uh, the thing here is, are there any organizations, NGOs, uh, where people with the syndrome can meet with their, with, with uh, professionals? Is there a, an organization? Well, there is the, uh, uh, Team Jack Levin, some of Team Jack Levin, there's a Jack Levin Facebook, uh, kind of, uh, of page that is, formed by patients with Jarko Levy, and you can interact uh, with patients. Recently, in, as recently as June this year, we created the Jarko Levin Foundation, or Fundación Jarko Levy, initiated by Dr. Elin Rosado, who is a pediatrician who has Jarko Levy. And he gathered all of what we are considered the experts of Jarko Levin in the island, and we are, which includes Dr. Ramirez Chuch, Dr. Simon Carlo, Dr. Norma Siniega, eh, Dr. Victor Ortiz, eh, Dr. Eh, Toledo, eh, eh, and myself. And we have been doing brainstorming and creating a, a web-based page called Fundación Jarko Levin, Spanish for Jarko Levin Foundation. And this is uh, mainly a, a directed to our research and medical advice for people and professionals that want to get more information about Jack Levin. And we are doing our own clinical research in order to promote and advance the cause of, of these patients. Well, there you go, I would, Tiffany. I would love to, you know, talk with everyone at the foundation. The funny thing is I had wanted to create something like that or an organization because, you know, being on TV and social media, I get a lot of emails from parents, new parents who have who have just been that di- their child has just been diagnosed with Jack Levins, and they have so many questions because, as Doctor, you know, Alberto says, 
it's the same story. It's the same scary, they're going to die, they're not going to make it, yada, yada, in 2020, which is still very shocking. So they mm-hmm. ask me all these questions, and I'm so, of course, I'm an adult, I live it, I am I am a pure example of Jekyll Levins. And so I mm-hmm. give my advice to them, and I try and help them as much as I can. Mm-hmm. A lot, um, it is difficult sometimes, you know, because I don't have mm-hmm. certain hierarchies or, you know, connections. But sure. in terms of my life experience, I, you know, let them know to, that it should be okay. So I would love to talk with you guys and, you know, give you a point of view as a person living with it. We should do a, con- a conversatory with both of you in Puerto Rico. Um, That'd be maybe great. We can arrange, maybe we can arrange for that to happen. I I want to say that... Uh, the Fundación Jarko Levin or Jarko Levin Foundation is working toward, you know, advancing the research in these disease and to uh, write papers. Because the only way that we have to, you know, educate people, particularly physicians, is by writing in uh, scientific peer review journals, that, which we have a lot, but apparently not enough for people to uh, read them and and get to know more about it. Particularly the management of Jarko Levin is extremely uh, still, I would say it's poor, even in Puerto Rico, which we're supposed to be the people who know the most about the disease. So, uh, so there's still a lot of, of things to learn, a lot of, uh, of, uh, camino por andar, like we say in Spanish. Así que, tenemos que seguir eh, educando, seguir investigando para desarrollar mejores manejos. There is no doubt. I don't want to give the impression to parents who are just diagnosed with a baby who comes with Jarko Levin or Jarko Levin newborn, there's no doubt that they are going, they can be com- serious complications. There's no doubt that the morbidity and mortality of the disease is much higher than uh, a baby without any abnormality. Uh, but there's also no doubt that if it's well managed, um, we can decrease that mortality uh, significantly. And once they pass this uh, neonatal period, they can become, you know, healthy and uh, productive children and adults. And Tiffany is a perfect example of that. I, I think there's clearly a lot of information lacking, not only for people who have the disease, but in the medical community. Oh, and sure. this is actually one of the main reasons that Tiffany and I are here today is because of that, because we think it's important to get that information out. And mm-hmm. even I know that Tiffany was told things by doctors that I know are wrong. And I, my understanding of genetics is very, very limited, but it's like, you know, hey, you don't, and so I think it's very, very important on both things, both on the population and on the physicians. So at least when they Google it, they get a basic understanding of what's going on genetics. To give you an idea, I want to say it in English and Spanish. When we first published the first uh, paper in the American Journal of Medical Genetics, presenting a cohort of 22 patients with Jarko Levin syndrome, the editorial board wrote wrote me back, you know, saying that this was not possible because it was this was a lethal disease. And I have to say, well, you know what? I have twenty of them in front of me. I can show you uh, their X-rays and their CT scans and their life and documented and send their pulmonary function tests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's it's been there. It, it, it was thought to be a lethal disease, and now it's thought to be a very high mortality rate. It does have a, a higher mortality than most children, but that doesn't mean that it cannot be managed properly. En español, hace muchos años, cuando el primer grupo describimos eh, eh, la condición de Jarko Levin en, el, en la revista Ameri- de Genética Médica Americana, eh, nos contestaron para atrás después que sometimos el artículo que cómo era posible que nosotros presentáramos un caso de 20 o 22 eh, pacientes cuando esto era una condición letal. O sea que hasta ese entonces el mundo médico pensaba que era una condición letal, invariablemente letal. Cuando yo estaba presentando 20 pacientes, entre adultos, adolescentes, niños, con la condición. Así que obviamente hemos aprendido mucho, y, eh, pero todavía tenemos mucho más que aprender sobre el manejo apropiado, la patofisiología de la enfermedad y... Y, el, y más que nada, cómo darle mejor calidad de vida. Y lo que dice Stifa, Tiffany, aprender a apreciar la gente por lo que son y a no hacer juicios. Porque a veces una palabra puede herir 
más intensamente que 40 inyecciones y que, que, que 10 cirugías. Una sola palabra. Las palabras pueden ser bien poderosas, así que aprendamos a usar palabras positivas y ser eh, in, inclusivos, no exclusivos. Claro, y de eso se trata el foro. That's what this um, forum is, is all about through our digital uh, website and our digital platforms. Uh, our goal is to help um, inform the public, inform health professionals, and uh, hopefully improve the lives of, of many, many, many people. And uh, we hope people who are just joining us share this video and share this conversation. Eh, me gustaría que todo el que vea este video lo comparta, nos ayude a diseminar información sobre esta condición eh, muy prevalente en Puerto Rico, pero además para ayudarnos a romper los estigmas para uh -huh. contribuir todos a mejorar la calidad de vida de personas como Tiffany, una puertorriqueña, you are Puerto Rican, even though you were born in New York. So, um, thank you so much for your time, Tiffany, for sharing us, for being so sincere. Uh, Asael, Asael, who almost Puerto Rican, because that name is kind of like sounds Puerto Rican. Asael Droll, a photographer, que creó el libro The Beauty of Tiffany, available on Amazon, right? Yes. Tienen que buscarlo. Y hemos estado poniendo fotos. We've been uh, using some of those uh, photos during this conversation, just so people uh, would know what we're talking about. Y al doctor. Alberto Santiago Corniel, quien es un, un gran aliado de los esfuerzos de comunicación en el área de salud, investigador, precursor en este tema. Muchísimas gracias, doctor. Gracias a la revista de Medicina y Salud Pública de Puerto Rico, porque eh, no solamente en Yarko Levin se ha mantenido a la vanguardia de todo lo que representa la medicina y salud pública en el país y en la población hispana, no solamente en Puerto Rico, sino en Latinoamérica. Y, y ha sido pionera, pionera en esto y ha seguido creciendo de una manera impensable cuando comenzamos esto hace 15 años atrás. Eh, así que gracias a la revista por, por darme el vehículo para ser, para ser parte de eso. Claro que sí. And hopefully thousands of people will be moved and inspired by Tiffany's story and the Asael book and are also more informed through Dr. Alberto Santiago Cordero's explanation about this syndrome. Thank you very, very, very much. It's been if, a pleasure. If there are physicians watching this, please get the book. Please spread the spread the word. Please share the video. We need to uh, spread the word. We need to, uh, people need to know that these are normal people with some respiratory abnormalities or some skeletal segmentation, vertebral segmentation problems, like millions of people in the world may have. So please, please, please uh, share the video, buy the book. I, I have not buy it, but I promise I will tonight or tomorrow because I've seen the pictures and they are breathtaking. Yes, yes, let them know that, you know, we are out there. There is a lot of us and um, there are some of us that have children and their children are gorgeous and there's nothing wrong with those children. And, you know, I'm friends with some of those women and it's, and it's refreshing and it feels good to see that that's possible too, because that was another like, no, no, no. So we gotta, you know, stop. We need to stop with the, you can't, you can't, no, no, you're gonna die. You can't do this. We need to stop with that and say, you know, look, this is possible. You can do this. You can live a normal life. You can have children. You can drive a car. You can have a, a, a job. You can have your own home. You could be a homeowner. You could open your own business. We need to do that more. And doctors mm -hmm. need to listen more and, and see. Somebody like me, I live a normal life. Like, like, like Myra, like Asael, like anybody else. I live a normal life, you know, and, and we need to put that out there. So let's continue to have this conversation. And fue un placer y un honor. Muchas, muchas gracias, Mayra. Y Dr. Cornier, muchas, muchas gracias. And Pedro, I know you're there. Thank you. Ay, y gracias. gracias. Tu español es muy bueno. Muy bueno el español. Así que oh, your parents did a good job there, too. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Asael, thank you for joining. I'm glad we could do this, finally. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, and just 
Hopefully we can continue the conversation. Continuemos la conversación en todas las plataformas. Que la, el mundo digital es el planeta entero. Muchísimas gracias. 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 Chao.